I think they're there. So I just wanted to take a minute and introduce myself and welcome you to this session of VR resources available to you. And again, this will be led by Crystal and Smith and Alicia Reidenauer from Southeastern Oklahoma State University. <laughs> All right. So we just have a few slides, but basically we're just going to tell our story of working with VR at Southeastern and how that is available through OER so that if you are interested in using any of it or developing your own, you know what resources that you have them <laughs> available to you. So, <laughs> okay, so that QR code right there will actually take you to the press book. We actually just piggyback off of an, off of an existing press book that we were already developing through Cole, which is the online learning toolkit. So in this press book, there's two sections. One is the online learning toolkit, and then the second part is the VR guide. So I'll open that up here in just a minute, but just kind of some background about what we've done at Southeastern. <laughs> During COVID, we had a OCO meeting where uh, on one from one net, what? I you up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, where we talked a lot about VR and the interest in bringing VR to the state and being able to find ways to get VR or AR, anything, some more advanced technologies into our institutions. So later, I also, uh, at the time, was the chair of OkiBug, which is the Oklahoma Blackboard um, user group. User group. <laughs> and we did a similar presentation there and had a lot of interest. And then later we had further meetings where we talked with OneNet about ideas and things that we could do. Um, around that time, we discovered Captivate was able, Adobe Captivate was able to use 360 videos and 360 images. When we came back to campus after COVID, we had the dilemma of students having to be six feet apart, of course, and we had a chemistry teacher come and say, okay, when I do an orientation in a lab, I tell everybody to come here and look at something and everybody's heads are not six feet apart. I need some kind of solution. So she was going to just make a video and I asked her if we could experiment. So we did a very simple Captivate module where it was just in the lab where we looked around the room, real estate tour style, and just had labels on things. And so we used that to then show the idea to OneNet and say, this is something we could expand. We can put buttons in here to show hotspots. We can embed videos. We can go further into other rooms. We can do all kinds of stuff with this. <laughs> so uh, we they liked the idea. We decided we were going to do this at Southeastern. And we set a very ambitious goal of doing 50 modules. And the intent being academic for instructors uh, to build modules that they could use in their classes. So we started with some more of those science labs. We also have a safety program. So we have one for uh, building scaffolding. We expanded it from there to things like singing with the choir and all kinds of things. And it took two years, but we were able to meet just this last July, that goal of 50, which I think all but four are in our press book. So I'm gonna to go to the press book. From the beginning, <coughs> this project was kind of opt-in with faculty that wanted to participate, but we informed them that this would be OER and that other people would be able to access the modules that they, that they build. So other people might use it, and or use their use these modules as a template. Um, mainly it's gone through Cole and OCO, uh, but the press book you can get to um, kind of has our whole story 
we actually did all of this really with student workers. The student workers figured out how to use Captivate, how to use the cameras, how to do the modules, huge learning process. It was a lot of fun. Um, this video actually has, it highlights the student workers. I'm not gonna play it for you, but if you're interested later, it shows them talking about it. One of them talks about how every day she, she doesn't come to work to find out what she's supposed to do or be told what to do. She comes to work to figure out what to do next, <laughs> what the next step is. It was a very creative process. Um, our process, really what this press book shows is kind of our own case study, but the students did most of the writing of it. And so they got to tell their story and give some instruction on how to do the various pieces. We organized the students into a video team, a uh, graphic design team, and a Captivate team. So some students would go in and take the mostly 360 pictures. We did some video, <coughs> but there's some issues with the file type that you use in Captivate, whether or not you can use an MP4 file or you need a YouTube video, various things, all of that's in there too. Um, but the students would go in and basically tell the instructor to do their lesson in slow motion. And so they would do a part of the lab, for example, and then they would wait for us to take the 2D pictures of everything. And then they'd do the next part where we'd do 360 pictures of video as well as 2D pictures of video. Um, and it would take about twice as long to do their lab. We would go back and the students would put all of the 2D pictures on Google Slides and send it to the instructors to caption. And then they would make kind of a textbook style looking graphic there in the module, you would simply click and it expands to show all of the things on the table or the things on the wall, whatever they were displaying. And they would also, in that environment, click to see the 2D picture, I mean, 2D video, and then go to the next phase where they would do the next step. Um, the last section of this is the sample completed projects. So these you can actually access. I will tell you they don't work well on your phone unless you have Google Cardboard. So, uh, but they do work great on a laptop. Part of our concern and why we were using Adobe Captivate is that remember we started this during COVID. Some people asked if we were going to do a VR lab where students would come and we would have headsets available for them. The idea of having a space where students come and share things that go on their face wasn't an option <laughs> the semester after COVID. So with Captivate, the headset is optional. You can do all of these from a laptop. And honestly, most of the students that we've gotten feedback from have. Basically, it's like a real estate tour, except with a real estate tour, you generally just move through the rooms. With these, not only do you move through the rooms, but you can click hotspots to see videos and see pop out images and read extra text. So we have um, the, a wide <coughs> variety. You can kind of scroll the, through these and see uh, some of the examples on there. <coughs> um, just some examples. <coughs> the Fort Washington Hall, when we had a student, he wanted to state a word. <laughs> the Fort Washington Hall, when we had a student that actually wanted to state a word for his research that he did uh, for that one, and he worked with uh, one of the tribes uh, to get information about that. And um, and so we were really proud of him uh, for the work that he did there. And then Cajun Fest, that was through our John Massey School of Business, and they just went through a new accreditation and the accreditors came and looked at that and they were extremely, extremely impressed with the work that we've done uh, with our students there, so. Cajun, said, Cajun Fest uh, was for a case study and so there's actually two parts, one where you experience it and one that has more questions in it. Um, we've had students with a wide variety of backgrounds too. It's not just students that are computer science. We do have computer science we have education major, the one that did Fort Washington as a history major. We have um, graphic design majors, just a lot of backgrounds. And it was really fun watching them work together because they would all bring something different to the table. And we had one night a week, we had Thursday was VR night. 
And so they would stay late till seven or eight, and they would either work on their projects or review each other's projects. And so, for example, the one who uh, was mainly a graphic design major, she would have a lot of hers done, but then the computer science major would come in and show them how he could he could tweak the code in there a little bit more to do some fancier things. Someone who was an education major kind of asked us, suggested some things to help them stop and think about things from a different angle. So it was really fun to watch the students collaborate. And this has been a really cool activity because it's a way that we're actually getting to share their work, the students' work, in collaboration with faculty, with a whole lot of different faculty. We did have all of the faculty had to uh, sign something saying they were okay with it being OER. And I really think we only had one or two faculty that declined after that conversation. But most of the faculty were very open to this. Now, most of the work was on the student workers end. They basically just had to present their lesson and then they had to uh, caption pictures. And then they got to go as many rounds as they wanted to of giving feedback and asking for changes, which some, whatever we did was fine. And some, we went a very long time, many rounds of feedback. Um, some of the others. There was no knockouts, though. No round, no knockouts. <laughs> There's two sections on here. So this green section is VR projects. Down at the bottom, there's responsive projects. The difference between those is two different file types in Adobe Captivate. A VR project is built for a headset, but can be done entirely on a computer. A responsive project is built for the computer, but some aspects can be done well in a headset. Um, and really, there's just different functionalities that determined which one we had to use. Um, if they wanted a lot of um, 360 video in it, for example, we needed to use a YouTube link instead of uh, embedding an MP4 video. So we had to do the responsive project wrap. And another piece was if they wanted questions that were not multiple choice, it had to be a responsive project. Adobe Captivate is built for e-learning. It could do a whole lot of things, but the VR project specifically was new. It had a little bit, it was a little bit more limited. It could do a lot of things, but not everything. We had some teachers want to push it a little bit farther, although there's one, one of the first ones that we did was um, a science lab on stains, simple and negative stains. She really wanted to be able to pick something up and wave it through the lens of burner. That's something you can do with VR, but not with the W Captivate. There are some limits. And the main thing to remember is that our goal was to that the headset would stay optional. Uh, but that also, going that route and using an e-learning tool instead of something you have to have extensive computer science background opens it up for our type of department to be able to do. So at this point, we can just kind of build that into the instructional design suite of services that we offer. If they want to build something like that, like this, they can come in and, and our students and um, staff can help create this because it is something that we um, understand and have the tools to do. If it was something that was a little bit more game oriented with some different tools, then we probably wouldn't have the right skill set to do that and wouldn't have been able to accomplish it, but it would be cool. <laughs> um, and possibly in the future that will happen, but this is where we're at right now. Um, let's see if there's any, I was just gonna show. We have some dissections in there. So how are teachers are using these? <laughs> Interestingly, a lot of the faculty who jumped on board first were the ones who are anti-online. <laughs> and it's because this was an environment, and remember this is right after COVID, they're being forced to do some things online that they didn't want to do, but here here we can at least bring in the environment, bring in some things that's a little bit more like the classroom experience. So a lot of the ones that we did first, the intent was for students who were quarantined, this was the solution. This is how they completed the lab. This is how they completed the assignment. Uh, beyond that, even for the students that weren't quarantined or had to use it as a backup, they used 
especially the labs as a pre-lab. So for example, if the students, when they first go in, I know I was not good at science, that was not my subject, and the labs were painful. I just hope that I had a lab partner that understood anything in there. But if I could have done something like this, where I could kind of go slowly and figure out what's going on, then once I'm in the classroom, I could probably have participated a little bit better. So as a pre-lab, the students could go in, see the environment, do the lab, watch the videos, read through the material, and by the time they physically go into the lab, they know what they're doing and can participate a little bit better. So that's how especially some of the science labs are using these. <coughs> the one for singing with the choir gives them a chance to practice at home. It has, um, I think, four songs in there that they sing with the whole choir, and then it breaks into alto or soprano, whatever their section is, and they can practice with the people around them. They can turn and see others um, in the room. We also have some for art, so art uh, theory and things like that. What really mattered the most was um, the main question we would ask is whether or not the environment made a difference in the learning. So if it was something that everything needed to be written on the board and it was just concepts, that's not really the best option for these. <laughs> but if it's something that would benefit by being in a certain place, then that's perfect. We even have one with the courtroom simulation. So we got to go to the county courthouse and um, and it's really more of a tour. So he just taught, the instructor talked about the different functions. I then piggyback off of that and use the same model but replace the videos for my comp class. And I compared um, writing an argument and essay to a jury trial. So I uh, have a video in place for the judge to explain that the instructor is not the one deciding if you're right or wrong. The instructor is deciding if you follow the rules. Talked about the jury being a peer, your, an audience of your peers. Talked about how you can be the prosecution or the defense, but she can't be both. Um, so things like that. Um, and that's been a lot of fun to use even in my comp class, where, you know, I probably wouldn't do a lesson on commas <laughs> with VR, but where you can come up with a scenario that the environment would make a difference. <laughs> it's a perfect tool. So we'll go back to, I see the tabs. That's another. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so the other thing that we want to talk to you about is that um, one that has made made it possible for other institutions to do this. The goal all along was not for Southeastern to do all of this stuff with VR, but for Southeastern to prove that it's possible and to make a way then for the rest of the state to get VR into the state. So OneNet provides VR toolkits, which is basically Adobe Captivate licenses, a 360 GoPro and the stand equipment that goes with that. And then we also have uh, meetings a couple times a month with any institutions that are working on this so that we can collaborate, ask questions, share ideas, give updates, and things like that. So if you're interested, either you want, <coughs> if you want to incorporate this into instructional design services, or if you're a faculty member and you're interested in building some of these for your own class, or if you have students that you'd like to incorporate this into projects, Again, a wide variety. The history isn't normally the most techie department, <laughs> but the, that was an amazing project because he involved his students in researching things about Fort Washita that were then incorporated into this. Our student um, was able to do tons of research that went into it. I mean, the amount of stuff he printed it out, and it was a huge book, honestly, of content that's all embedded in there. But he also did some really creative things to make it accurate. He really cared about having historically accurate costumes and things like that. So he actually had people pose. He had people tell the story. For that one in particular, we imagined it being used more for um, elementary schools before they go to the rendezvous of Fort Washita or homeschoolers or things like that. 
So for children, we wanted a little less text. So instead, he had people pose and created avatars that pose there. And I mean, you can tell me the story. So, um, so we, he went. He had a couple of people locally to uh, pose for some of them, but he needed a Civil War soldier, and it had to have the right. <laughs> so he ended up going to Fort Gibson to get somebody um, with the right uniform and get um, some poses to put in there. So it was very cool. You kind of have to spend some time wandering around in there to find the characters and tell you the story. But it's a huge model and has a lot of cool stuff. So kids even could play around there. If you have a headset, you can wander around in the headset, but you don't have to. You can just wander around there using your laptop or whatever you have. So, all right, any questions? <laughs> so this QR code is the form to request a toolkit from OneNet. Is all the video shot using GoPro? Sorry, what was that? Is all the video shot using GoPro? Um, we used a GoPro. You could use a different camera. That was what we had, uh, and it worked really well. Um, and it can do both video and uh, and pictures. You can also set a timer and go hide. But now we have a remote, which is really nice. But for really most of them, we had to play hide and seek with the camera. We actually did one tour of the student union, and um, we made a point, like, we got permission to go in before students were in there, but we didn't think about the cafeteria work being there, and so we go in the cafeteria, and we're like, we set the camera, and then we're like hiding, and this lady came out so mad because she thought it was her employee's play, <laughs> and so... Uh, that was a little interesting. There's some pictures, if you really watch close, that you'll see like a tree and there's like a little foot sticking out of the bottom. <laughs> so we got really good at diving behind things. A lot of them, if, if it was a lab, we just, we were just students in the lab. <laughs> we just were there. There was another. Um, so I see this support. Is there like an group, ongoing group right now to develop more modules? Yes, she's in it. <laughs> um, I think there's four or five that meet with us regularly. Maybe there's five or six total, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, there's a few universities that are participating that are working on a few modules each. And then we usually meet like Fridays at 10, like every other Friday or so. Um, and one that organizes those, but we've we kind of check in in those meetings, and then whatever means there are like we've had some of our student workers as well as other staff Zoom with staff at other universities to help figure out how to publish or what to do with the score package or how to do something in Captivate or things like that. And then in those meetings themselves, a lot of it's just brainstorming um, and sharing ideas. One of our really fun ones, actually, just remember, um, kind of at the end, we were like, all right, we're only a few away from our 50. <laughs> but we were in the middle of a Canvas transition, and faculty were not nearly as eager at that point to jump in and do this project. So uh, we started getting a little more creative. So we have one that we did as a proof of concept for the theater department where we did a murder mystery and we have the whole skit and they could go through and choose and try to solve them. So that one was a lot of fun too. So that put it a little bit more in their control because it was a concept that they were doing when it was still academic to show them. Yeah. It's your murder mystery one for the end, like after you did some other ones. I looked at that one. Yeah, it was it was the video, the later. It was, it was, it was, it was yeah. Like people moving around out the still. Yes, uh, and that was the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, with the 360 videos, you have to be very careful because you cannot hide. <laughs> there is nowhere to hide from a 360 video or a picture, but the video is you have to plan it out. And our department is not actors, <laughs> students. So kept having problems with the guy who was supposed to be co a court feeding the evidence next to him. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so when using things like that. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you.